Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 194 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers, here as always with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. That episode of episode 200 is coming closer. It's looming. Every time we say that, (laughs) we are taking you guys' suggestions for what to do with episode or for episode 200. So keep those coming. Hello at themomhour.com. We we have a great topic today. It's a big one. Um, We're talking about helping versus helicoptering. That's like a, those are big words. Helicopter parenting, over parenting, um, being overly involved in our kids' lives is, it's easy to place a label on it. It's hard to parse it out. I think. My yeah. It's really hard. It's, it, it can become almost undefinable and depending on your child's, uh, a lot of factors that from the outside, people really wouldn't even know like your child's temperament, yeah. any struggles or challenges they might be facing. Um, if they have a learning disability or yeah. something that, you know, they're not neurotypical, something like that can really change things. And yeah. also like If you're in a high stress time of life right now, that can change things. Your personality, like there's so many factors at play. And I think we tend, as we love to do here in the good old United States of America, (laughs) we like to put things in boxes and we like to apply sweeping judgments and labels to things. And it's, and you know, you, Sarah, you and I live in the world of nuance. Yes, we do. We We occupy this other place. (laughs) We like to push back when it seems like there's such a right answer because I mean, this quote unquote helicopter parent idea has been around for quite a while now, and it gets a lot of vitriol, a lot of it's it's um, there's a lot of judgment that comes along with those helicopter parents. But I think anytime we do that, we oversimplify a little bit. And the other thing I think that is interesting is most of what we hear about with helicopter parenting, I think, has to do with mm, older elementary school and then especially middle and high school. You hear about, you know, parents rescuing their kids out of every academic struggle or yes. every friend struggle, or you think of them putting them in bubble wrap and not allowing them to do things independently. But one thing I think is interesting is when you have babies and toddlers, <laughs> you're not going to free range them and drop them off at right. the park. So how do you, what, what is and the, it all starts somewhere. It right? all starts somewhere. Yeah. And what does yeah. that transition look like? to not becoming a helicopter parent, giving your kid a longer and longer leash. But, but also like when they're really little, you, you really do have to like physically protect them. And so I don't think we have enough conversation about what does that look like for a four-year-old, for a seven-year-old? And how do we not arrive at this place where we're like now one of those helicopter parents? I'm putting that in quotes because I have a lot of empathy for people who end up there. I don't think they meant to, honestly, Uh, most of them. And I've always found it really strange and backwards sometimes the way we do things, um, the way we can do things culturally here, where there's sort of like a push for babies and toddlers to be more independent than they really can be. Like, you know, potty training really young yeah. or being able to sleep through the night before they're yes. you know, even developmentally ready yet. Um, things like not picking a baby up when they cry because you might spoil them. Stuff like right. that can really become part of like our cultural, I guess, conversation about parent- raising babies. But then it's like when they get into elementary school, we have to clamp down and suddenly like pay attention to everything they're doing and not let them have any freedom. To me, that's very backward. It should be it should go the other way. Right. Like your your grip is a bit tighter at the beginning and then you slowly let it let it go. So, um, yeah, Yeah. we're going to dig into a lot. Oh, my gosh. I'm excited. I'm excited about this. We almost like just started launching in. We have other things to tell you guys. One is that Katie's with me at the end of this show, and I'm really excited. We announced this on Instagram, but Katie's been coming on for a couple years now to chat with me uh, periodically on the podcast, but we're shifting our focus. And we're going to be talking about books each time she comes on the show in 2019, everything from parenting books to little kid books to fun fiction for moms. So basically all kinds of books. Um, and so you will hear Katie and I in our first book segment of the new year, and we're going to be talking about fiction for moms, fiction we are loving lately. Um, so stick around for that and let us know what you think of that. Um, so that will happen after Megan, we dissect all of the helicoptering. Um, yep. but first we are welcoming back our sponsor, Disney code names. Really excited to have them back today. Disney code names is a family game. It's by USAopoly or the op, which is a game company that has been entertaining families for 25 years. And Disney code names has taken the classic family game code names, which Megan, you guys are familiar with over at your house. Yeah, we love it. And mm-hmm. then combined it with beloved Disney characters 
characters, which my kids immediately recognized and tore into the box when we got to try this out. So I hadn't heard of the original code names, but I was glad to hear that it was a hit in your family, Megan. But with Disney code names, we are loving it. And we're kind of in a challenging phase right now where my youngest is often not quite ready to play harder strategy games. But one thing that is cool about Disney code names is there's a word option, an option to play it with words and another option to play it with pictures. And those pictures are Disney characters. So it just kind of included everybody um, and yet kept the older kids interested too. I also love that it's real easy to play a quick round of 15 minutes or less. You could play it with two people or all the way up to eight people. So just for our family setup, there was a lot of flexibility that I loved. You guys can find Disney code names at Target or online at Target.com. We will put a link in the show notes. It's $24.99. Makes a great birthday gift. Um, something to keep at home for a snow day or a rainy day. Yes. So again, it's Disney code names. And just check it out in the game section of your local Target or online at Target.com. Okay, so this is so funny, Megan. This this topic came about because I'm reading a great book that I'll talk about later, but you also had a story yesterday that made my jaw drop a little bit. Will you yeah, this okay, so... <laughs> I was uh, actually playing a board game with uh, Jenna and Missy, who I went, I roomed at college with Jenna, but we spent a lot of time at Missy's dorm and my brother, et cetera. And I just happened to look at my Facebook and one of the groups that I'm in, a mom was talking about the fact that her uh, son, I believe, who's at college, she's like in his, um, like it's a Facebook group for parents whose kids go to that college, right? So Right off the bat, we're yeah. in a different world than my parents. Like my parents could not have cared less what other parents were talking about yeah. that, you know, yeah. happened to be the parents of other kids in my dorm. But there was a complaint, like a bunch of parents were complaining because something had gone awry with the thermostat and it was like set at 64 or something. Okay. And they thought that it was dangerously cold. And the mom who posted it was annoyed not only that by the idea that 64 is dangerously cold, but also that a lot of the parents were saying like, I pay good money for, you know, my kids to go to school there and to have a safe dorm. What I was blown away by and brought up to Jenna and Missy and my brother and Missy's husband was in, in no world, in no universe, when we were in college, would my parents ever have known what my dorm thermostat was set right. to. I mean, first of all, I probably wouldn't have known. Right. Like I might've been like, oh, it's really cold in here. Yeah. Put on some extra socks or whatever. I never would have called my parents about yeah. that. I didn't want to talk to my parents. <laughs> like I was, a, I was gone. Like I was at school. So to involve them in something like that would have been completely just outside of any realm of possibility for me. I couldn't believe it. My jaw was dropped. I, and you told me this and I was like, Oh my gosh, my jaw was on the floor. And it, you know, I I I want to be sure that we're not like we're not hurling at judgment at any one of those individual people. I think what we're commenting on is how normal that is now. How normal right. it is to know the temperature of your kid, your adult child's 18-year-old's room 2000 miles away or 100 and, miles away. And to to have that become a part of your day, like yes. to be so invested in that, that you are actually engaging in conversation about it and have an opinion about it and are actually going to take the time to call the Dean. I mean, like what I, to me, yeah. it was just, I, I didn't know what to do with it on so many levels. Yes. Like yes. The, how quickly <laughs> things have changed, how much they have changed the kind of communication kids must be in with their parents now. Yes. Because I guess it is different. If you can just pick up your phone and text your mom, like, Oh, today stinks. You know, right. here's a picture of the thermostat. Like, right. Do something about it. Right. I, I just, the whole thing to me felt like, I felt like I had gone into some bizarro world, like a hundred years in the future, not only 20 years since I was in college. So I think we are in a bizarro world that is it, that future has arrived. And so now <laughs> I'm excited because I get to talk a little bit about this book. I mentioned it two weeks ago, actually, when we talked about toddlers versus teenagers, but I'm now finished with the book and it's called how to raise an adult, um, by Julie Lithcott Haynes. And I will of course link it up. Haynes, excuse me. Um, I will of course link it up in the show notes, but she was the Dean of freshmen at Stanford for 10 years. And so she mm -hmm. saw those, she saw those freshman kids and their parents, and she saw the change that happened starting. She talks about it starting in the late nineties, which interestingly is when I went to college. Um, 
I arrived at college in 98, and she kind of starts talking about it from then to the next 10 years, in particular, mm -hmm. like the early to mid 2000s. Um, and just what kind of kids and what kind of a parents were showing up in her office with all kinds of things from what classes to take, what to major in, to things probably like what temperature is the dorm and how do I reach the dean to talk about it. And so her commentary on all of that is not to berate those parents and those kids for being that way, but how did we get here <laughs> where, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, she talks about the research of, of 22 year olds taking their parents with them to a job interview and um, a dad following up with the person who interviewed the kid to, you know, say something completely out, like completely involving themselves in their adult kids' lives in a way that, yeah, for you and me makes our jaw fall on the floor. Right. So um, the book is fantastic. I think as a mom of younger kids, it's really motivating to me. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today is like, we know we don't want to end up there. I think most of us. But how, like, how do we not end up there? Because mm -hmm. we're in this culture now. Um, I, I know we're going to kind of talk about some of the stages, but I do want to read one little quote from the book. And this is not the author talking. It was someone she interviewed who had raised an adult daughter. But I read the sentence like three times because I loved it so much. So he said, I think a critical part of parenting is knowing where you end and where your child begins. Non-anxious mm. observation is so important and wonder is the reward. So non-anxious observation is like what, what I think of when, if you think about a kid kind of unfolding, we've talked about this, like figuring out who your kid is because they're just sort of developing before your eyes, yeah. whether it's a baby or a toddler or a teenager but I love that pairing of those words, non-anxious observation, because I think that's what we're going to get into today, which is we don't want to disengage to the point that we don't care or that we're not helping our kids. Right. But the anxiety that kicks in when we think we have to control every little thing or help mm -hmm. with every little thing, that's where it gets. Well, tricky. and anxiety, anxiety begets anxiety, because when right. you are anxious, what do you like? What is the my reaction when I'm anxious is to want to do something yes mm -hmm. um to solve it yeah and and then you can't act your way out right of anxiety necessarily right but like you think you can and yeah there's and there's i love i love that he unpack. says wonder is the reward the reward yeah. for stepping back and letting kids become real people before our eyes is a positive thing yes but and watching them do it and and knowing that like we're part of the secret sauce but we aren't yes you know Yes. Sauce. So that's my new goal. <laughs> Non-anxious observation. I'm that's what I'm Love striving it. for. Um, I don't know. So how do we like how do we not become the parents? Well, let's break this down by stage. I okay. think it's it's fun because I think because we do see over parenting typically as something that happens with older kids. I think it's it's nice to go to the origins and just see when it's like how it manifests differently at yep. different stages and ages. And so we kind of just jotted down some thought, thoughts yeah. about this, but. I'll start with babies. Like, you know, for a baby, everything seems so dangerous. So yeah. babies seem like they're, you are keeping them alive, literally. Yeah. So it makes sense that like from a biological standpoint, it makes sense that this is a high um, anxiety time. Mm -hmm. And even though you really only have like four major choices, this is what I put down. Feeding, right? What you're going to feed them and when. Yeah. Sleep, mm -hmm. how they're going to sleep and where. Their health. So like what you're going to do about medicines and, you know, yeah. how often you're going to see the doctor. And then I put schedules. I don't even know if that's really, that might even just go with the other three yeah so maybe it's really three things but like there's so much importance put on those three yeah. things because it's all you've got yeah the other thing that I think is different about nowadays as opposed to like when our parents had us is that nowadays because of we have so much access to so many other people yes um at the click of you know the tap of our finger on our phone we involve so many other people in our decisions like yes directly and indirectly and even thinking about this story with this Facebook group of parents like it's very easy to get caught up in a group mentality. Yeah. So if you're in a group, something that may never he even occurred to you to be a problem now can seem like a problem. Yeah. And it's something you want to discuss with these other parents and like everyone's talking about yeah. it. And, and that starts in different ways, but yes. it starts on Instagram and on Facebook and yes. everything else from the time you have a baby. Yes. Like it's now it's just part of you. Well, at all times. Yes, absolutely. And I think if you, especially, but not only, but especially if you um, are wanting to be extra attached and responsive to your newborn, which is a great right. goal to have, um, 
that responding to the infant's need is such kind of a, it's, it's so simple at its core um, to pay attention to your baby's cues, to respond to their needs. But then it gets extraordinarily complicated, like you said, with the addition of gadgets and opinions and groups yes. and people. And so it takes something that is fundamentally fairly simple, which is babies have needs and they will communicate them to you. And your role is to respond, especially those little itty bitty, itty, itty bitty babies so that they learn that you're there, right? Like that's the kind right. of the theory of attachment. Um, but we managed to make this so complicated so that there's guilt at every step. Like you can't possibly be doing all the things right. So let's look at what I might be doing wrong. And maybe the, you know, maybe it would have a different result and it becomes stressful. Um, so yeah, I, I'm curious what, what would non-anxious observation, what would this slightly well, dialed down approach yeah. be with a new baby? Because we're not going to be less responsive. Right. Well, Sarah, when you were talking, what it, what I realized when I started to think back to the anxiety I had when I had a baby, like, um, especially my first two is that you, what we need, they need to be fed. Mm -hmm. They need a safe place. They need warmth. They need love and attachment. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And we conflate those things with a million other things that aren't those things. Correct. So if you really break it down and you just say, well, my baby really needs is love and yeah. all the rest of it's going to happen. Like yeah. if I'm going to, if I love and I'm responsive to my baby, they're going to get fed. They're going to sleep. They're going to yeah. have all these yes. things they need. But we conflate that to mean they need organic pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> Or yeah. they, because that's love. Yeah. Or they need handmade baby food because that's love because we yeah. don't have that many ways to show it. Right. right? They're babies. Like, what do we have? Like, right. all we have is the things that we can do for them. Yes. So, and, th and then it's things like there are other caregivers and even things like risk assessment. I feel like I remember getting into these kind of knockdown drag outs about choosing car seats. Uh -huh. um, and of course you need a car seat that fits yeah. the safety code. Like, I get that. But like, where like how much you love your baby was somehow related to how much money you had yeah. to spend on a car seat. Mm -hmm. It's like, we look for all these ways to kind of like gauge it mm -hmm. and judge it and measure yeah. it. And it's not measure. It's like, it's, you love your baby. It's not, it's not, and it's an unwinnable game because there will is, always <laughs> be something that you're not able to or willing to do. And so if that's a measurement stick, it's, it is not a winnable thing. I was thinking, is there an antidote to this? Is there a, is there a dialed back version of this? And I, the first thing that comes to mind for me is surrounding yourself with, um, if possible, more seasoned moms who yep. you can just observe. You don't have to take their every advice because you're, you're learning to hone your own, your own instincts, but just to surround yourself with a variety of different types of parenting styles and people a little more ahead of the game. And I think that's why yeah. some people like listening to this podcast is it's like, Oh, I see now the, the variety of ways to get from a to B if, if B is having a well-adjusted happy baby, like it's not, right. it's not something you can order from Amazon. And so, right. um, <laughs> I don't know if there's Turns any out. other. And then I think like maternal mental health, taking care of yourself. And um, we have a great episode yeah. with Kate Rope that I can link up in the show notes. I think if there's, if there's two things that, that would help dial back this intensity, yeah. it would be be surrounding yourself with, with other moms who are maybe a little farther ahead and then really taking your own mental health seriously. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's and, any other. And I will also say when, when you're surrounding yourself with other moms, like I think that what goes along with that hand in hand is being very selective about what media yes. you're taking in, what influences you're taking in. Like not all information is equal right? and not everyone, all opinions matter, should matter yes. to you. Yes. And so pick a few that make you feel a little bit challenged, but mostly pretty good. Yep. Like that's kind of how I would look at it. Like yep. if I feel like I could always do something a little bit better, but mostly I've got this and I'm doing yeah. pretty well. I find that it puts, it has me in a healthy state. Yes, of, I agree. Like striving, but not too hard. I agree. You know? I agree. That's why yeah. I like I, I tend to seek out resources that kind of validate what I'm already doing a little bit, but then challenge me to do it more as right. opposed to make me feel terrible about all my choices ever. Yeah. You know? And challenge and they challenge you to do the things like you're drawn to resources that challenge you to do what you know to be right. Yeah. But it, not they're not challenging you to do to throw everything out the window right. and do something completely different right. or right. It, it's like challenging you to be a little bit better version of the mom you are. Yeah. Which is going to look very different yes. from someone else who has a different style. So it's, it's just like, yeah, like selectiveness about what, what uh, data, yeah. I guess yeah. you're taking in. 
Okay. <sighs> okay. So what, what about it, though? Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're moving along. We're trying to dial right. back the. I don't even call it helicoptering with babies, but the yeah. the intensity with babies. And now we have yep. some toddlers and preschoolers. So yeah. what? Where does it flare up here? Do you think? So like, I feel like with toddlers, this is where I really started worrying about the way I looked as a mom in public. Mm-hmm. Um, other people's opinions and perceptions just kind of mattered more because your choices are so out there. And Mm -hmm. even sometimes your choices have nothing to do with what's out there. So like your failure to get your kid out of the store before they had their meltdown, Mm -hmm. even though it's really not a failure because maybe you had no idea what was going to cause the meltdown. Yeah. Like it's very public. It's just out Mm -hmm. in front of everybody. And I think that's when we start to try to like, we take a lot of that on ourselves. We Mm -hmm. try to, we try to head it off at the pass, sometimes not for the right reasons. Um, I don't know. What do you think about the toddler years? Yeah, I, I, I think that <laughs> I think the um, the if we get into a pattern of making decisions based on public perceptions, and I think you have said it so well yes. on the show that any time you've made a decision based on what other people were, would think, it's almost always the wrong decision the wrong for one. you as a mom. Yep. And I do think that in the toddler years, this is where that starts to flare up. It might not yet be about academic achievement, but right. sometimes it is. Are you enrolling in every music class because? That's what it seems like everyone in your town is doing. And is that really how you want to be spending your days or are you doing it because it feels like everyone's doing it? This is where the keeping up with the Joneses and the, the kind of, um, the author, this Julie Lithcott Hames in this book calls it the checklisted childhood. Like we've turned childhood into, well, you got to do AYSO because everybody does AYSO and you got to do little league because everybody does little league. And, um, I don't, I think the toddler is, years is where it just barely starts, but pay attention to public perception and, and peer pressure. And by, by all means, if these are things that you want to do and bring joy to your life as a mom and your kid, there's nothing wrong with them, but it's yeah. a slippery slope. So yeah, I think public parenting and peer pressure are, are really start to crop up as you move out in the world with your toddler. Yeah. And, and also what other people's toddlers, not only what you're doing for them, but what they're doing and what does that mean about you? So like that two year old is speaking in full sentences. Mine can barely get a word out. Like, what does that mean about what I'm doing and what am I doing wrong? Do I need a tutor? Like, do I need to be doing flashcards? Like what what are the things that I'm not doing that is resulting in my toddler being behind or seeming behind or having fits when other toddlers aren't? So I do think this is like where it Step, like where it starts and it doesn't look the same you know you don't see the path from the toddler that you're trying to do everything for to the college kid who yeah. can't like negotiate their grade with their professor without you getting involved but it it doesn't just suddenly happen right it, it this is it's like it is the beginning and I'm going right. back to that quote of non-anxious observation like it robs us of the ability to be like wow my kid is really extraordinarily fill in the blank this way. It, when, right. when we are checklisting things and comparing things, we're actually missing the opportunity to see what's actually happening. And that's true whether they're right. two or 12, but, yep. um, so preschoolers, I love what you wrote down here with preschoolers. This is where it, they have a little bit more independence. They want to do things by themselves. They are starting to be capable of doing things for themselves. And we get in the way. And this is a hard one. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago with toddlers versus teenagers, the, the desire that kids have to do things by themselves and how tempting it is as a parent to jump in and rescue them, especially when they get frustrated. And this is where you guys can go read the book. You can do the research, but that struggle to do things themselves and the, the um, benefits of struggling through something and figuring it out on their own it's such a muscle that as parents, yes. we have to, it's, it's excruciating to watch a kid try yes. to buckle their seatbelt by themselves. Or, I mean, forget those types of skills. What about work out a sibling dynamic by themselves yeah. or, or get hurt feelings from a friend and bounce back that resilience that, um, these things that we want our 18 year olds to have, they start really, really young. And I think preschool is a time where parents can challenge themselves to just step back and say, is this, is it necessary that I get involved? Sometimes it is, or yeah. sometimes you just want to, sometimes you got to get out the door and you're going to tie their well, shoes for them. But, <laughs> yeah. but if you don't start, if you don't start having that little voice that questions your own responses, um, it's, it's hard to undo that later. Yeah, it is. And I, and like I even said in here, it takes more time. Like yes. it takes more time to let your kids do things for themselves. And we're our hurried people. Yes. And they may fail, which is hard to watch. Yep. 
but also teaching takes time. Like, like teaching them to learn to fish takes more time than making them the fish or right. catching them the fish yeah. or whatever. Right. But over time, it, like even talking about in the, the chores episode, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. um, that we recently did, like the teaching takes time, but it's worth it when they know how to do things for themselves. Yes. And I think in, in general, I think that I tend to be more motivated by positives than negatives. So one way to like, look at this is not, we're trying to prevent kids from getting to college and not being able to wipe their own butts. Right. Um, but we have an opportunity. And I think the preschool years is when we, we get so many opportunities. Yes, like this I is when agree. the opportunities really start. We have so many opportunities to help them build resilience. And there's been so much talk about resilience and so much research about resilience and how really that's kind of like, that's the magic. That's the magic thing that if you have it, you know, you'll be okay. You know, you can try and fail and try again. And like, without that, you don't know that. Like you don't have the tools. You don't have the knowledge or the confidence that, um, that you're able to handle life on your own. And that's all resilience. So I I totally agree. And I think sometimes we, we hear that we hear, okay, great. I understand that. But then we think it'll look like this after school special of a kid, like learning to tie their shoe and feeling so proud. It's building resilience is messy and it, it Mm -hmm. is not pleasant for a lot of human (laughs) beings and kids in particular. And so we have a little bit of an obsession with keeping our kids happy, making sure they're happy, well-adjusted. So I just want to throw it out there that part of building resilience is being okay with your kid having a really rough month or year. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously being available and having that non-anxious observation where you can say, huh, maybe there is something deeper at play here. Maybe we need to look into this. That's all great, but not swooping in to fix hard, hard times or hard feelings that, that a kid's disappointment, a the big ones and the small ones is part of what builds that resilience. And so we want it, we want them to have it, but we don't always want to watch them go through it because it can be hard. And I also think that this is where like things like limits play in and seeing them through. And I am all about like your kids having a rough day. You know, I am all about a special treat for ice cream or whatever to make them feel better. But I think sometimes that line can get crossed a little bit where we're so anxious for them not to feel bad that we try to stuff it. Like yeah. we try mm-hmm. to make them happy, whatever yep. we have to do to make them happy. We're going to do that thing. And that could look like feeding them. That could mm-hmm. look like buying them stuff mm-hmm. that could feel like that could look like distraction. It could look like us putting aside our own needs. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. To like, <laughs> like to I'm make them happy. Yeah. Right. And like, it can look a lot of things. And I think every now and then absolutely like, yes, treat your kid because they had a rough day and everyone needs a little extra something sometimes. But like, there's the flip side where sometimes they're just going to feel bad and you can't throw your whole stay aside to fix it for them. Well, because and you it. like you said, you can actually see that as an opportunity. Like it sounds yep. cheesy, but like, oh, good. We get to practice this disappointment. Right. Like we get to, we get to move through this because that is ultimately is the best outcome. That's what you want. So that's kind of yeah. preschoolers. And I mean, so much of what we said keeps translating into the other ages, but we made some notes yeah. about, um, elementary school. I think some of this is fresh for me. Um, having, read yeah, this I was just, well, and you're, I'm in it, but yeah. like, I've been in it for so long that it yeah. doesn't have the same impact on me anymore, yeah. but you're very new in this place where all your kids are in elementary school. So I'm curious how it feels to you right now. And like what you notice. Yeah. I think that the number one thing I notice in the culture where I am parenting, which is a affluent Southern California is, um, this assumption that all families want their kids to do everything and be everything. And by that, I mean, club sports, um, intense, you know, musical classes, a a ton of after school activities. Um, and it feels a little, it feels a little bit, um, panicky, I think for some families who think, but I don't know if my kid wants to be in all these things, or I don't know if I want to spend my life driving around in a minivan. And so I, I mean, you guys, if you're a longtime listener, you've heard me push back against this a million times, but I do really feel like I need to get the word out there that if everyone, if that's what the, the culture that you're raising kids in, you can be the one who opts out of that kind of stuff, that kind of rat race feel. Um, so I think, I think that ratchets up in elementary school. I know you're going to talk a little bit about academics ratcheting up later, but I think the very early, um, indicators of, uh, Families who put a, a, a high prize on things yeah. like straight A's, you know, getting the projects like perfect. And I've, I already noticed that in our school community. So again, I think it's like at, 
at what cost? I mean, I wrote, I wrote down if they are so overscheduled and you are over so overscheduled that you find your, yourself, you know, putting all their laundry away for them, clearing yeah. the table. I, I, we, you know, we just did that whole episode about chores. Um, yeah, it, it, it's hard. Yeah. It, it is really hard. So I don't, I feel like that wasn't very articulate, but well, those are the things I'm noticing in elementary school right now. And it's not black and white because you do live in the culture you live in and you do, and you do have to see these other parents and your kid may really want to be in a sport where if they don't get in a club, they're not going to play that sport in middle school. So right. it's not like, I would never say like, this is, this whole thing is ridiculous. Don't be part of that culture because right. it's dumb and, and competitive. And like, it's just like, I don't know, like knowing your family's story yeah, and, and setting your line in the sand and like what we talked about, like our arbitrary rules or yeah. not so arbitrary rules. Like, yeah. what is it? Like, how do I want to exist in this world as a parent in this world that I live in, right? Yeah. This little eco or little um, ecosystem that yeah. I live in. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's even helpful. <laughs> no, I think, I think it is. And I think, um, going back to the, when we did the chores episode, we talked about life skills and talked about this being kind of a prime age for, oh my gosh, they really are capable of so much. And they, they are starting to be capable of independence, but it, it takes intentionality and work to start to introduce those things. So we talked yes. about in that episode, and if you haven't listened, you can just go back a couple of weeks. We talked about chores and life skills, but it's kind of related, especially at this elementary school age, because it, it does, they're not just going to start volunteering to take out the garbage. So it has to be like right. an intentional choice on your part. And it, I, I hate to tell you guys, but time flies. Like my seven yeah. year old is now going to be 11. I mean, she's not seven, she's almost 11, but it feels like she was just seven. <laughs> right. And there's a big difference in what she's capable of now. And so I'm, I'm not blaming sports and overscheduling on all of it, but I think there's some tied up in it because these in this, these independent life skills that we want our kids to have, they don't have time for them if they are never at yeah. home kind of participating in the family culture like we talked about in that episode. So. Well, I'm glad that you said the thing about family culture because as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, like we, again, just like with babies, how everything feels so fraught, mm -hmm. we we tend to over um, put too much importance or over import <laughs> mm -hmm. various things that will not impact them forever. Mm -hmm. So like oh, the grade yes. they get on a test or whether or not they make it onto the team or yes. whether or not they play well on the team or whatever the thing is, right? It's very unlikely that that one thing in fourth grade is going to affect them 10 years down the road yes. in any major life-changing way, but you know, it will affect them mm -hmm. and continue to affect mm -hmm. them as your family culture. Yes. So I think family culture always has to come first. It is the good of the whole as, a, as opposed to the good of any one individual, yeah. which is like kind of the point yeah. of life, right? And so if you can just keep that in mind, whatever your family culture is, that's fine. Yeah. But like that takes precedence yeah. over this one kid getting to do this one thing. Yeah. I totally or agree. Or having to do that one thing. I totally agree. Um, <sighs> I know. So right. We, should we move into middle school? Yeah. Let's because do... here's the good news. Okay. Like, I have some good news. Okay. Here's the opportunity. I feel like if you lay the groundwork at the toddler preschool, elementary school level, it's not as hard or as shocking when you get to middle school because basically now it's just kind of compounding. Like mm -hmm. the, the problems are new. Your child is hormonal. Like things yeah. are different and shifting and like they become tricky and weird. But like if you've set that foundation that you know where like you've you've confidence where you stand as a mom mm -hmm. and you know what's important to you and you know where your family culture like how it plays into this bigger picture and you've surrounded yourself with good people who love you and your kids and aren't like going to judge you. And like, so mm -hmm, you've done all mm -hmm. this groundwork, then you can, you can enter this middle school with a little more grace. <laughs> do you, I guess. do you see parents, I'm curious, do you see parents who clamp down harder in middle school on things like, you know, freedoms and technology yeah. and because they, maybe they realize that they it's haven't, starting to get away from them. Yeah. They haven't yeah. set that foundation. I, Their kid I maybe isn't of, prepared. Yeah. And so then they have the knee jerk reaction to take more control instead of what we should be doing in middle school, which is probably, you know, having less control. Yeah. Well, and I'm, and listen, I'm not going to make a judgment about the way people decide to handle something like social media or technology. I have more lax rules than people. And I know that I have more um, stringent rules than other people, like about all of those things, mm -hmm. phones, phones in rooms, um, how much freedom kids can have on the internet. Like, and it's a moving target. Like yeah. I might decide to give a certain amount of freedom and then a kid blows it and they lose those freedoms. Like, yeah. so those are all things like, 
I'm not suggesting these aren't important things. They are important things. The kids are messing up their lives. Like these are things that really need to be looked at, but not all kids are messing up their lives yeah. forever. You know, and it's like you, you have to kind of even things like academics. I mean, they do get serious and middle school academics can impact high school academics. Like if you don't get into the upper, the highest level math class in eighth grade, you're not going to start at the higher level math class in ninth grade, which may mean you're not going to get to calculus. And that may mean you're not going to get into this program down. But like, we can't future cast everything. No. And that's, that's like a, really at the heart of this book too, is at what, right. like w- who decided that elite for your college experience is worth backtracking to fifth and sixth grade right. about academic choices at the expense of maybe where that kid is at socially, academically, what they really need. So in other words, like we've started with this end goal that may or may not be the right end goal for that kid. And it's affecting choices we make and they make years earlier, like at what cost, at what cost, at what cost. And, and why is 18 years old this now like deadline? Yeah. Like why does this all have to be figured out by the time, you know, a kid gets into their senior year of high school so that when they leave high school, they can immediately transition into this extremely intense college experience. So that for what, to what right. end? And like, we've got it all, like we've, yeah. we've, we've like compressed this timeline down without even knowing who our kid's going to be at that exactly. age. We don't know. Like exactly. when your kid's eight, you don't know who they're going to be at 18. You have no idea what they're going to want to do. And yeah. they don't know either. So it's like, we're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> So we're in borrowing trouble. Yeah. And it's know, like FOMO. It, a right? grandmaism. Like it's yeah. FOMO. It's fear of like, if they don't have every opportunity now, doors will be closed later. And while there may be some truth to that, again, I come back to at what cost? Like, right. at, yeah. Very yeah. Interesting. All um, right. Well, so like, let's move into high school. Okay. So here's the nice thing about the, the weird thing about high school and the good thing about high school there comes a point in high school and I'm going to say it's like around the end of 10th grade where like there's you've kind of done what you can like academics are what they are. I mean, your kid's GPA is what it is. If it's great, of course they want to maintain it, Mm -hmm. but if it's already really bad, like they're not going to make it up the last two years of high school. Like there's just certain things that are kind of being set Mm -hmm. in those first couple of years, which adds pressure, but you can also take that as an opportunity to remove some pressure yeah, because it's going to be okay. Like no matter what, it's going to be okay. But kids have like a ton of options. They have choices about how to use their time, um, which might be hard for us to let go. Like yeah. they want a job. Is it okay if they get a job or should they be using that time on school? What's more important to them? Are there the benefit of the benefits of them getting a job? Does it outweigh the benefits of them doing four hours of homework a night? Like mm-hmm. there's all these little choices to be made. And I think that's when we really need to like, let them make those choices. Yeah, And it's hard. Yeah. But hopefully if they've had little bits of practice and you've had little bits of practice as right. a mom, then that's, that's what we're aiming for. And it doesn't mean that you can't have an opinion or that you can't right. put your foot down. Like right. I wouldn't say, yeah, go ahead and get a job after school every day, 30 hours a week. Because I also know that a teenager isn't going to be realistic about their ability right. to handle that like necessarily. And they might not really understand the impact that will have on their sleep and the family's right. Like, right. but again, it comes down to the family culture, right? So if the most important thing is we all need to be in the house three nights a week doing house things mm-hmm. and homework and all the things we have to get done. And that's everybody like that includes everyone. Mm-hmm. then that's different than like, no, you can't get an after school job because right. I decided it's more important for right. you to do this right. uh, ACT class right. or whatever right. it is. Right. right. So right. I don't, you know, and the middle and high school is still emerging for me. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I do think that if we kind of lay down, the, the idea should be that it gets easier. The mm-hmm. idea should yeah. be that it gets, that our grip relaxes. Yes. The to- the issues get harder. Right. And bigger. Right. But we become more of these like emotional support people. Yeah. In the background. Yeah. In a checkbook, frankly. It's the wonder is the reward, right? Like you <laughs> right, are, you right. have practiced non-anxious observation and like little by little letting go. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully you are more in the background. Ugh. Um, well, we I should know. take our break and we are going to come back and talk more about this. But Megan, why don't you set up our first sponsor? Yeah, I'm excited about this one because you know how I feel about care.com. 
Oh, yeah. Care.com is the world's largest digital marketplace for finding and managing family care. So you can find care for everyone in the family, like babysitters, nannies, housekeepers, dog walkers, senior care, tutors, errand runners, and more. Um, I've personally used it for both nannies and occasional sitters. And even though I live in a small town, I've been really impressed by how many caregivers I was able to find just by typing in my zip code. And that's true whether I've wanted them full-time, part-time, just like on a weekend, whatever. The other really cool thing is with care.com, you can find, book, and pay for your care, plus pay nanny taxes all in one place with care.com home pay. Um, care.com also provides access to a variety of background check options in case that's important to you. You can purchase that to help you make those decisions. And you can join for free as a basic member to start looking. So if you want to just see what's in your area, you don't have to pay for that. But then you're going to want to upgrade to premium membership so that you can reach out to those caregivers, schedule interviews, and book and pay for care online or through their app. We're going to get you 30% off of that care.com premium membership. Just go to care.com slash mom hour when you subscribe. Again, that's care.com slash mom hour for 30% off a care.com premium membership. Nice. All right. Well, we know we have a lot of moms in our community who are making career changes right now or heading back to work after some time at home. So I'm really excited to welcome back our sponsor today, the University of California, Irvine's Division of Continuing Education. So we know it can be intimidating to make changes in your career, in particular, if you've been home for a few years and you are thinking of getting another degree or heading back to work. And we talk a lot on this show about how that evolves um, throughout your years as, as a mom. So we have been there. I love that a lot of UCI's continuing education programs actually happen online, so they're flexible, but they still offer a really immersive online classroom experience because you get to collaborate online with your peers and learn from expert instructors with a ton of industry experience. They've got certificate programs and specialized studies programs available, everything from business to IT, healthcare, finance, law. And you can advance your career in as little as six months. And since not everybody gets to live right down the road from me and from the UCI campus, the online courses make it easy to learn new skills and advance your career from wherever you live. So spring quarter is coming up and registration is open. Visit ce.uci.edu slash podcast to learn more. Again, it's ce.uci.edu slash podcast to find out more. Okay, Megan, we have a lot more to say about this, clearly. We sure do. That first half of the show, like, didn't even scratch the surface of what we wanted to say. Um, so we knew we were going to head into a part two of this for you guys next week, because I still have my books segment coming up with Katie. Um, but we would really love to hear from you guys. There's a little bit of time before we record next week's episode. So I would love for you guys to send us a message, record your voice. Um, we might even play a few on the show. And Megan, what do we want to hear from people? I would love to hear how, how this is working in people's real lives. Yeah. Well, and I would also love to hear, you know, maybe if you listening to our first half, like have been able to reframe those hard moments as an opportunity, maybe brag to us a little bit yeah. about like that, uh, the time you took the opportunity to let your kids struggle. And like, maybe are you feeling like you're able to shift your mindset about that? Um, I don't know that we're looking for questions exactly, but more like little success stories yeah. or just like, just share with us like how this looks in your house right now. Yeah. I think all of us, and we'll talk about this in part two, Megan, but all of us have areas where we lean more helicoptery. I know I do mm -hmm. where I exert more control than probably I need to and areas where we feel like we can be more hands off. So if you, if you feel like you've successfully really empowered your kids and have stepped back, stepped back and, you know, been the opposite of helicopter parent, I would love to hear that. So just, yeah, leave us a message. You can record your voice and email us the audio file to hello at the mom .com. Everybody's phone has a little voice recorder. That's one of the easiest way ways. Um, and then also on our website at the mom .com, there's a little sidebar thing called speak pipe and you can head to speakpipe.com slash the mom hour. It's there. It's on our site. And that is a little feature that allows you to record either way works. We love getting your messages and it would be fun to listen to some and play them on our Part yeah, two, I think Megan. that would be great. We're also going to kind of like have some questions you can ask yourself to decide in the moment, like whether you're helping or whether you're unhelpfully helicoptering. Yeah. Ooh, unhelpfully helicoptering. Yeah. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, it is hard to know. So yeah, we'll have a yeah. little and then we'll we'll kind of go through some scenarios from all the different age ranges and continue to kind of workshop through this. All right. Well, we have got my books segment to get to with Katie. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to remind you guys to check out our sponsor, Disney Codenames at Target. We have loved working with them this month. And if you are looking for a great family game, it's Disney Codenames. And we will link up a link to uh, purchase at Target in our show notes. All right, Megan. Well, next right, time. This has been fun. Talk to you guys soon. 
Hey guys, it's Sarah and I am here with Katie Addis. Hey Katie. Hi Sarah, good to be here. I know, I'm so excited. So real quick before we dive in, if you are a new listener or a new-ish listener, Katie's been coming on the show with me periodically for, I don't know, almost two years? It's been two years now. Two years. Um, But we're shifting um, what Katie talks about this year. And she's going to be doing a books reading and books segment with me every other month for 2019. Um, We're really excited. We have a bunch of topics planned. So when we say books, we mean um, today we're going to be talking about fiction for moms, the fiction that we as moms read. Um, But we're also in the future going to talk about books for kids, parenting books, um, and all kinds of books related topics. So super excited for that. Katie, thank you for being my reading friend. I know it's like a book club over podcast. I love it. And also, if you guys don't know, if you're new around here, Katie is in my family room right now with me. Um, That's different from how Megan and I record remotely. As you guys know, we live across the country from each other. Katie lives literally walkable, walkably close to my house. We usually drive our matching white minivans up and down, but (laughs) she could walk. Um, So that's kind of fun too. We're here in person together. It's so funny. And because I'm a brunette, just like Sarah, um, when I'm driving my white minivan down Sarah's street, I get these waves as though I'm Sarah Powers, you know, like these very friendly, familiar, like, oh, such sweet affection for Sarah Powers, but it's it's really me. That's so funny. Yes, we do have matching, matching cars. Um, okay. So Katie's kind of brought the topic today. Do you want to kind of set this up? Sure. Okay. So, um, again, so if you have not listened the whole, through the whole archives, um, and learned about Sarah's reading tendencies, she's going to share those today. Um, but there's been a little bit of a commitment made on Sarah's end to read more fiction in 2019. Yes. And, um, as far as my, reading habits. I kind of do a mix of fiction and nonfiction, but I definitely do love my fiction. Um, so I, I have a couple interview questions for Sarah kind okay. of delving more into her reading habits and all respond to the same okay, question. Let's do it. Um, so Sarah, mm-hmm. why don't you read fiction? I know I have like a mental block against it. I think the short answer is, um, nonfiction feels like I can decide ahead of time if a book is a good fit for me. And I kind of can judge it by its cover, literally, and be like, yep, I want to learn that. Or I want, I I read a lot of biography or memoir, that kind of nonfiction. Okay. Or like self-help and parenting books, motivational books. It just feels like I can look at it. It's like looking at a podcast or a podcast episode and you're like, oh yeah, I'll like that. And it feels easier. Uh, Fiction to me feels like, I don't, I, how do I know if I'm going to like this? Which like, (laughs) who cares, right? The other thing is because I'm out of the habit. I think anytime that you're in the habit of consuming a certain kind of media, the algorithms of the world, like put more in front of you, like you might also like this. And so I just uh get in a cycle of like, what's the next nonfiction book I'm going to read? And I'm out of the habit of reading fiction. And until somebody puts a book in front of me and says, like, read this, it's literally physically here, take this, read this. And then I do and I like it. It's just, yeah. it's like a weird habit. So that, that is so funny. I got. And ironically, you were an English major in college. Okay. So yeah, I was a lit major all the way through college and like a very, so that is another thing I've thought of is like, maybe I just got as- burnt out, got burnt out or associate reading fiction with like doing all of the other work, like writing papers about it, thinking about it, analyzing it. That's a yeah. really good point. Um, yeah. And I've, I think I've never joined book clubs for that same reason. Like <laughs> I've talked about the books I'm reading. That's all I did for the first 22 years of my life, you know? <laughs> right. And there's a reason I didn't go on to a graduate program in that. I mean, I love it, but um, I think that that's a piece of it too. That's a really good, good point. So Yeah. Well, I would say that um, I have read more fiction in the past than I do now as a mom. And okay. I think that my reason is because my attention span has just completely waned. Yeah. And I think it's because the slices of my um, time yeah. pie are mm-hmm. so narrow for time spent mm-hmm. alone that half the time I'd like to do something that is yep. more engaging and easier yep. on my mind. Yep. Um, so I tend to, and this segues into my next question, I tend to start a lot of fictional titles and you should see my library hold mm-hmm. list. It is just chock full, but I will get all of these holds and be so excited. It's like the first day of school, you know, opening right. up a book, um, just the prospect of new beginnings. Yeah. And, Ooh, this is so exciting. And then um, if it does not just spell, spellbind yeah. me, 
I'm done. You're done. I'm yeah. I'm not a stubborn finisher, even though I do feel a tad bit guilty that yeah. I don't do that. So my next question is, are you a stubborn finisher? Yeah, I have a real, oh. I think I feel like Megan and I talked about this. I can't remember which episode recently, but I do have a hard time not finishing books. And that probably prevents me from starting some right. because that's where I get caught up of like, this has to be the right book. Like I have to know I'm going to like it. Right. Because I'm going to stick through. Um, I think we're going to talk about a couple books that we maybe abandoned in the last year. And I do have a couple, but it, it is hard. It's like major Enneagram one guilt. Like yeah. I didn't finish. I didn't like do what I said I was going to do. Which yeah. Is so dumb. So dumb. <laughs> I understand though. Um, okay. So what, give me some titles or a couple titles that okay. you tried okay. reading and Tr- couldn't finish. Okay. I have two and I'll, I'll be quick. So okay. um, we went to Rhode Island last summer. We go every other year. And I thought... Um, wouldn't it be fun if I read a book set in, cause Newport, Rhode Island is this very historic, um, like the Gilded Age mansions. There's all of this, like it was a crazy time in American history of like the Rockefellers and like that kind of thing, like this crazy amount of wealth. Yeah. And there's these big houses and I knew I wanted to go tour one, which we did. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. It was amazing. And so good thinking. I was like, wouldn't it be cool to read a novel that's kind of set in that time period or like a historic, like historical fiction? Yeah. Um, and I do like historical fiction. So I, I found one at the library. It's called The Maze at Windermere. It's by uh, Gregory Blake Smith. And it interweaves like three different time periods right there in that New England area. Um, and it was good. It just didn't, like you said, it didn't spellbind me. And my whole, my whole idea was to kind of immerse myself in the place where we were going. Cause it's yeah. so different from here. Mm-hmm. I still think that was a good idea. I just, I didn't finish the book before we left for that trip. And then it just didn't, it was good. <laughs> it just I read like half away. of it. And then the other one is, um, I decided to read great expectations last year. Um, the only Dickens I'd ever read was a Christmas Carol. And I didn't even read that till like two years ago. So I somehow made oh, it okay. through four years as an English lit major without ever reading Dickens in high school or college. Wow. Oh my gosh. So that's shocking. I decided to read great expectations and I got it from the library. The embarrassing part is I stuck with it for like 400 of the 500 pages. And then it kept being due at the library and I kept renewing it. And then finally I couldn't renew it anymore. And so I just turned it back in the guilt of having an overdue library mixed with the guilt of abandoning the book. I was like, I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> so I got like 90% of the way through great expectations and then stopped. So those are the two that I abandoned last year. Okay. I'm your twin there. Okay. Because great expectations is one of my 2018 titles that I did oh, not really? finish either. How funny. And actually, if I had recommended a title to you of Charles Dickens to start with, well, I guess outside of the Christmas yeah. Carol, I actually haven't read the a Christmas Carol, but I would have recommended a tale of two. Cities. Okay, and I've heard that too. Ugh, um, the characters and the plot, and yeah, and there was a lot. There is a lot that I get a kick out of with Dickens. It was a different kind of challenge, and I'm still glad I read it. And in other circumstances, I would have finished, but it w- was so long. And I think I was going through a phase where I wasn't reading very much anyway, so it was just sitting there racking up library finds. Yeah, so maybe I'll go back. It wasn't Dickens's fault. No, not his fault. Uh, I don't blame him either. Okay, well, one book that I did not finish in 2018 that I actually really, um, I started out liking and then it just quickly lost um, okay. its steam for me. And it's a total frou-frou chiclet book and it's called When Life Gives You Lululemons. Okay. <laughs> I think it's um, I think it's Lauren Weissenberger. Okay. I did not look up the author before, but um, it's, the same author who wrote The Devil Wears Prada. Okay. And it's actually a sequel kind of to The Devil Wears Prada, but it takes place probably a decade after or maybe 15 years later or something. And to me, um, the character just read so differently Mm. that I had lost kind of alignment with her. Like I felt more of an affinity with her in The Devil Wears Prada. It was... um, I read it at a time in my life when I too was kind of just starting out my career. Yeah. And well, I was going to say that, I mean, when your life has also changed from that, but maybe the characters had too, and it still didn't. Well, yeah. So, so she has aged of course, which has changed her, but for some reason it, it was almost like, um, a transformation in sort of her like ethos as a character. She seemed a little cruder to me. Um, and just, I mean, uh, you know, 15 years prior or 10 years prior, she was like this naive, doe-eyed um, girl that looked right. at the world, you know, full of promise. Um, and 10 years, 15 years later, she's like completely jaded, um, 
kind of burnt out, dried up a little bit Mm -hmm. and it just didn't resonate with me. So I stopped reading um, probably 10 chapters in or something. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm that it should be another goal of mine is to be more willing to abandon fiction because I think that will help me try out, like put less importance into picking the title, just pick it up and try it. So. I think so. All right. Okay. Well, let's get into what um, you did read in 2018. Okay. So, so you start us off with the title. Okay. So I am going to talk about a book that I think I did talk about on the podcast a long time ago. Um, But it was one of the most interesting books I read in 2018, and it's called Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders. Um, So if you do remember me talking about it, I I don't think I went into as much detail, but it's written as a play. So it's written, um, it is fiction, but it's written uh, in, what do you call that? Like, like screenplay. Like it's, yeah, um, in a play. Yeah. In a, in a play format. Drama. It's drama. Okay. Um, And it's very unusual storytelling. Um, it is set in Abraham Lincoln's presidency okay. um, and it is a bit supernatural, which so all of these things so far add up to something I would think I would not like. Right. And the way it came to me is Brian listened to the audiobook, which is again, b- performed very differently because then you would have characters voices like speaking the parts. Yeah. Um, but I read it in book form. Okay. Um, and Brian was like, I really think you'll love this book. Um, it has enough of the historical fiction element of um, learning about some real things that happened during Lincoln's presidency. He had a young son who got sick and died actually as a 10 year old. That's no spoilers. I mean, that is a thing that happened, <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it is kind of centered around that. Um, and it is funny and irreverent and there is a supernatural element. There is there, they, there are ghosts, which is totally something I would not gravitate toward because I tend to like things that are rooted in more how I experience reality. Yeah. Um, but I stuck with it and I will say about 80 or 90 pages in, I was like completely hooked. hooked. And just finishing it felt so different than anything else I was reading at the time that it stuck with me. Like I, I remember things about it. So yeah. So that was a good one. Okay. I have a quick question mm-hmm. for you. The Bardo, um, from what I remember hearing little bits and pieces about it, isn't it set um I know you said the time but is it set in the underworld or it's something so it's set in a kind of like it well it's set in a cemetery but the concept involves a kind of like a purgatory almost yes, or like okay. this um this belief that you are kind of suspended between worlds until things are resolved for whatever oh, okay. reason so I mean depending on like your I guess your belief system or like different ways this could be told it would be like a purgatory or like uh, like an in, an bet- in between an place. in between place. Okay, um, interesting, and that adds the whole supernatural. Yes, so there are literally well. like these characters. Most of them are, I think we would say like ghosts or okay. like they are they are no longer of this earth, but okay. they are um, experiencing this kind of purgatory. It's very interesting. interesting. Okay, so it's Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders, um, and I think if you like historical fiction, um, if you like literary fiction, drama, any of those. Um, it's surprising. It is a surprising book to like. Okay, cool. Well, um, I'm going to, um, take us a little lighter. Okay. Uh, firmly planted on earth here in a novel called all we ever wanted by Emily Giffen. Um, Emily Giffen is a prolific author. Yeah, I know author. that name. I know I've read a couple on the beach sometime. Oh, or yeah. yeah. I mean, she is like the consummate beach read author. Yeah. She's is kind she of like the cross... something borrowed, something blue. Those yes, ones. Yes. yes. I, can't, I don't remember. Read all those? I've read some of them and I could not tell you the plot of any of them. Okay. It's like they go in one year, not the other. But I think I probably liked them. Okay. I, mean, I don't have anything bad to say. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this is, um, it's actually different than her whole collection of, books though. So normally at the center of her stories is a love story and then, you know, problems arise and then happy ending yeah. typically. And I've read every single one of her books, but this one um, is a grittier topic and it's definitely one that's very current to um, our life today. Okay. It's all about a social media post, uh, a scandalous okay. social media post um, posted by a teenager mm-hmm. And it basically directs the course of the lives Mm -hmm. of everybody involved um, in this post. Mm -hmm. So both the poster and the subject of the post 
and uh, the respective parents mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. these two teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, and Emily Giffen, true to her style, she um, alternates narrators. Okay. Yep. So it's um, uh, the mom of the the social media poster, the mom of the the perpetrator. Um, her name's Nina, um, and Nina, she entered the rich elite through marriage. So it's um, it's like wealthy Nashville is the setting. Um, so you get her voice, and then you get the voice of the teenage daughter, the subject of the social media post. Um, her name's Lila. And then you get Tom, the dad of um, Lila's dad. So Tom is a blue collar worker. He's a, he's a carpenter. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Tom and Nina's lives sort of intersect um, because, of course, of the social media post. And what I loved most about it was was how thought provoking it was mm-hmm. on so many levels. I mean, um, you know, how are we as parents going to... Um, instruct our kids in this very important topic of digital citizenship and digital responsibility and mm-hmm. what's okay and what's not okay. Um, and if they do screw up in this context or um, in other serious contexts in life, what are we, I, I guess, um, how do we show them unconditional love? Do we show them in unconditional love by, um, making them take responsibility Mm -hmm. and paying the consequences or um, do we, and this is a question that that's explored. um, Do we just uh, make excuses for them and make it go away in any way possible Mm -hmm. Um, because they're wealthy? um, You know, it it would be easy to just buy, um, buy away Mm -hmm. the sort of guilt uh, or the, the sin, you know, but it just um, so many, so many good thought provoking questions. I really, really loved it. And for a delicate topic, um, I think Emily Giffen handles it with care and thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't have a nice, neat ending either. Um, that's, that's not really spoiling anything, but um, just very, very well done. Nice. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. I just saw the musical Dear Evan Hansen. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Which has a lot of the same themes. Oh, okay. Everything from from wealth and class to teenagers screwing up and parents dealing with it in different ways. And yeah. 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 Really interesting. So it's a good read. Nice. Um, okay. So the other one I read last year was a reread. I actually forgot that I reread this till we were prepping for this outline. Um, and I reread A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. And I want to say oh, Megan. I in, love oh, that one. It is. Like, and okay, so I, I want to say Megan inspired me to reread it because she rereads more than I do. Like she has comfort books that she goes back and reads like every couple of years. Uh-huh. And I did that a lot as a um, like tween and early teen. I would reread books all the time. And then I kind of stopped, I think, because I, I just was reading all new books. So um, I reread A Tree Grows in Brooklyn and I had not read it since the first time I read it and I was like 13 years old. Me too. I was a freshman so, in high school. Yeah. I think I w- it was in the summer. I remember the summer when I read it and I want to say it was between either seventh and eighth or eighth and ninth. So I was either 13 or 14. Um, it is by Betty Smith. Um, I happened to have a paperback copy. I already owned it. So I just pulled it off the shelf. It is, it's long. That's one long thing book. I like this paperback doesn't make it look long because the font is small and the pages, but it's 465 pages. So it is like, it's not a quickie. It's so charming. It's oh, it is so, so charming. I was thinking it would read more like, okay, this is a coming of age novel, almost like juvenile, juvenile fiction, right. but it, it isn't, it's an adult. I mean, it, it's both. It is both. It is a coming of age story, but it absolutely as a almost 40 year old is entertaining and poignant and it has that historical element that I like. I love things set in New York. Um, so yeah, I'm not even going to really talk about the plot or themes. You've either read it and loved it, or maybe you missed it, but I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. Well, okay. I love rereading a text like this mm -hmm. because like you said, it's equally both a coming of age and an adult story. So you hit this novel at the two perfect times in life. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, because yeah, I'm sure you had such an affinity for Francie as, you know, a 13 year old, but then now you had affinity with Katie. Yep. Dealing with a flawed husband. Yes. So good. Yes. Yes, it is. It is so, so good. So 
Um, yeah, if that's one like that you missed, like I somehow missed Dickens and, you know, even uh, those of us who love to read have books like classics that we just, for whatever reason, never missed. Um, yeah. I can't imagine not loving this book. Well, that's a good habit that um, actually emerged, Sarah, about your reading habits that you do not reread typically. I typically do not reread either, right. other than like classic titles like that, maybe. Yeah. And it's uh, sometimes you feel like, well, I could be reading something new, but there is something very satisfying about a good reread. And also I have I have a lot of amnesia about books. Like I can remember oh, totally. the feeling of wh- how I felt about a book, but I, I, I forget the plot. So it's new every time. It's yeah. new every time. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I, my last title is another classic and this was a new read for me. Um, but it is a classic and it is Anne of Avonlea. Okay. So that is the sequel to Anne of Green Gables. Yes. And, um, what initiated my read of Anne of Green Gables was not Anne with an E, the Netflix series. Okay. Um, but because my book club and I decided to read it and I'm in a book club with three women, we meet four, well, three total. So okay. me included. And we meet four times a year. Okay. It's very low key. Yeah. yeah. That um, is low key. So anyway, Anna Green Gables, um, fast forward, I then moved on to Anna of Avonlea and it is, um, maybe a notch down in the delightful charm of right. Anna of Green Gables, but it's a continuation of the coming of age yeah. of Anne and, um, Anna Green Gables, spans about two years as does okay. Anne of Avonlea. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a great episodic read. So mm-hmm. you can kind of like stop and start. Yeah. I like I think all of her books, Lucy, Maud Montgomery, all yes. of her books have that episodic quality. Yes. Um, and the commentary on like provincial life, like the town and the people is my favorite. When you yeah. told me before we recorded that you, re- that you read, uh, I mean, I read everything that that lady wrote when I was probably early to mid high school, again, I haven't gone back to anything except Anne of Green Gables. I have reread that and I've read it to my oldest daughter, but um, those would be great rereads too. Oh yes. Yes. I cannot wait to read them to Annalie once yeah. she's old enough. Yeah. What, what age do you think is old enough? You know, I know I, you said, I, cause the vocabulary is rich. It's yeah. And actually I love reading aloud, but it is a hard read aloud. The sentences are um, purposefully flowery yes. and, and complex in structure So if you're not accustomed to reading aloud, um, or if you have a kid who squirms with longer prose, um, it can be, because the story is so relatable, right? To kids. I mean, I think, I think Allegra was eight when I read it aloud to her, but she has a good attention span for that kind of thing. Okay. And I was able to pull back and sort of contextualize for her because the stories are simple and funny. They are. But the language isn't. So you kind of have to deal with that, but you could pair it with reading a little bit and watching the old series or the movie or so I, I want to say she was eight um but I think you could you could co-read that with like a tween you know kind of take turns reading aloud yeah you could, there's a lot of ages where it would work yeah and and I mean for a young girl specifically the way the lens through which she views mm-hmm. life it's like she invented the rosy glow of an mm-hmm. Instagram filter like mm-hmm. she viewed life through just um I don't know. Her whole life philosophy is grounded in optimism and romance yeah. and giving but people the benefit of the doubt. Too. Like she she has does. real feelings too. So yeah. that's why, and she screws up. So that's <laughs> why it's like, it's this like old fashioned fancy setting, but it's a very modern telling of like tween and early teen adventures emotions. and misadventures. Yeah. 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 So it's a good one. Well, that was so fun. I know we could go on and on. Okay. So guys, we want to hear what you are reading. Um, and we should say also that every time we do a book segment with Katie, there will be a blog post, um, on the mom Just go to the blog section and we will do a book list every time with yeah. everything we mentioned, the books we went into detail about, but if we mentioned uh, other books offhand, we'll put those in there as well. Um, kind of like its own show notes, um, for this episode that you just listened to. So you just listened to episode 194 with Megan and me, you can go to the show notes there, but then we'll link out to the separate book list that we'll put together. And that's how it'll work. Yeah. Every time. Sounds good. This was so this fun. Was super fun, Katie. And now I'm inspired to keep reading. Fiction. Hopefully it so sparks conversation you. maybe on the mom, our Instagram or something. We yes. can keep this conversation going. Totally. All right. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.